Uh, well, good morning, um, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, this, uh, I think, third uh, of our annual reports on uh, education funding, um, very kindly supported by the Nuffield Foundation. Um, this morning, we're going to look particularly uh, at challenges facing further and higher education. We published um, earlier in the autumn work looking particularly at schools uh, and also at uh, early years funding, though in the report, full report today, you'll find those uh, analyses as well. Um, this has now, even just in its third year, I think become one of the uh, big events in um, education uh, policy as my colleagues look in detail at our, what has been happening uh, to funding and education and what the challenges are going forward. I'm delighted today to say we've got a, a great array um, of speakers. Initially, uh, we'll have uh, a few words from Josh Hillman, who is uh, head of education at the Nuffield Foundation, who have so kindly supported this work and seen uh, the value from it. Then my colleagues, um, Luke Sabietta uh, and uh, Jack Britton will speak to the report. Luke will talk particularly about um, further education and Jack about higher education. And then we're delighted uh, to have uh, Mary Kernock cook uh, and Philip Auger to discuss uh, some of the implications um, of this work. As you know, uh, Mary is a former chief executive of, of UCAS and Philip, of course, uh, wrote the extremely uh, good and influential report on uh, further and higher education a couple of years ago uh, now. So they'll reflect on, on where we are there. Uh, there's plenty of time after that for questions from you. You can uh, put those questions on Slido uh, and you should have the link for that. I, I'm now going to shut up. We'll have each of our speakers in turn without any further interruption from me. And then, as I say at the end, uh, plenty of time to get questions via Slido. So let me hand over now to Josh. Thanks very much, Paul. I mean, I don't want to stand too long in the way of the research findings and the, the brilliant pair of respondents and the wider discussion, so I'll keep this brief. For the past three years, we've funded IFS now to undertake this series of annual reports on education spending, and I should say we're now discussing with them uh, an evolution of this approach uh, going forward. I just wanted to run through four characteristics of the series which have made it so powerful and which I think we'll see reflected um, this morning. Independence, breadth, depth, and timeliness. Now on the first, we've got the privilege of being an independent funder and that in turn gives us an obligation to share that same independence with those that we fund and those that we work with, um, allowing them the freedom to challenge orthodox policy assumptions and where necessary to speak uncomfortable truths to power. Um, and now combining that independence with rigor and tenacity provides the foundation for legitimacy and influence. And the annual reports have become, as Paul said, established in the calendar as the principal and authoritative source for data and analysis on education spending. So the headline figures from the series have probably been the most heavily quoted findings from any work we funded during this period, both in the media and in other organizations' reports and policy documents. Most importantly, they've also had a huge impact in the real sense of the term, playing a key role in shaping decision-making and the wider public debate about education funding. Policy context is particularly ripe for this sort of work with continued uh, pressure on public finances, economic change and uncertainty, uh, and increasing cohort sizes. So for example, the analyses from the first report, which included the notable 8% drop in real terms, school spending headline figure, were directly influential on a significant policy shift in the form of the government's school spending settlement in autumn 2018. And there's been a slower burn influence on post-16 skills and further education analyses over, over that period. Secondly, breadth, it's frustratingly unusual for research and policy analysis to look comprehensively across the different phases of education in its essential uh, aspect of these reports that they cover public expenditure from early years through schools 
um, and into further in higher education. And this allows us to explore both the trade-offs um, and the knock-on effects of different funding arrangements and flows at the different stages. The shifts in investment priorities over time um, and issues of the balance of public and private uh, financial contributions phase by phase. And now while today we're focusing on FE and HE, I do commend to everyone the wider body of work from which uh, the presentations are, are drawn. Third depth, each uh, annual analysis features within it a more detailed focus on a particular stage. And in this unusual year, the team have ended up taking a number of deep dives uh, such that they probably don't have too much oxygen left. In terms of today's dive, in, in general, the ostensible boost to FE in terms of policy attention in the past year or two has not had a correspondingly uh, improved research evidence base. And the re report, today uh, addresses one aspect of that, which is the public finances. Finally, timeliness. Another advantage of independent funding and research is that we're able to be flexible and when necessary respond fast to new challenges. And the impact of COVID-19 on education generally has been obviously enormous. And Nuffield has funded a, a wide range of projects to explore this in detail, which you will be able to find on our, our website. But the particular issues around education spending are critical and fallout from the lockdown period, the cost of mitigation and catch up, the effect on student numbers, uh, and most importantly, the wake up call for a broader and long term structural change, which I hope we'll have time to discuss this morning. I just want to thank the IFS team, too numerous to uh, name them all individually, all people have been involved in this, in this project for the extraordinary work they've undertaken this year, they've had to simultaneously navigate ever-shifting ever sands of the topics that they're researching, but also the challenges of doing so, locked away for much of this period of time in their bedrooms with shaky broadband and, and all, the other, all the other difficulties. I'm sure these thanks are echoed across the policy provider uh, and research communities. With that, I'll hand over to Luke. Uh, thank you very much, Josh, for such um, kind words. Um, as, as Josh and Paul have indicated, the focus of this year's annual report has been the uh, significant challenges facing all sectors of education as a result of the pandemic. Um, in today's event, we're focusing on uh, further and higher education, but it's worth setting them in the context of the equable size of equally sizable but quite different challenges facing schools and the early years which we released detailed analysis about earlier in the year so over the last 10 years um, schools have faced a eight to nine percent real terms cut in spending per pupil um, the government's new funding settlement from last year near enough reverses those cuts up to 2022 but that will still leave spending per pupil about the same level in 2022 as it was in 2009 which is a very historical historically large squeeze and schools also face significant extra costs particularly schools serving deprived communities they've seen larger cuts over the last 10 years they face um, additional costs for catch-up given the likely widening of educational inequalities and higher costs in the form of higher teacher starting salaries um, with regards to the early years, um, spending on the early years has, has kind of increased significantly over the last 10 to 15 years as the entitlement to free early education and childcare has risen over time. Um, but the big challenge for the sector at the moment is when will demand for early years uh, education and childcare return to pre-pandemic levels or will it ever return to pre-pandemic levels? And the implications that has for the viability of, of early years providers across the country and the extent to which there are then inequalities in access to early years provision. And if you want more information on that, please read the early years chapter of this year's annual report or the more detailed briefing we did on early years uh, in the summer. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm gonna focus on further and higher education where there are also challenges, but quite different sets of challenges. So if we look at the last 10 years, um, spending per funding per student in further education colleges and sixth form colleges has fallen by about 12% in real terms since 2010. 
that's the largest cutting spending per student across all areas of education for young people. And it leaves spending per student in further education colleges only about 13% higher than it was 35, 35 years ago. That's a really significant squeeze in historical terms. Um, and they now face all the challenges related to COVID. Higher education has seen a very different profile of spending per student over time. It was eroded mostly throughout the 1990s as funding didn't keep up with student numbers. There were then big boosts in higher education spending per student, upfront higher education spending per student as a result of increases in tuition fees in 2006 and 2012. And following that latest rise, spending per student was as high as around £10,000 per student. However, HE spending per student has also been falling over the last 10 years as tuition fees haven't, all, haven't kept pace with inflation in all years. The big challenge affecting higher education now is uncertainty. Uncertainty over student numbers. They're presently just about, well, they're, well, they're, they're higher, higher than they initially were expected. Um, but whether they'll, whether they'll stay that level is, is the big challenge and whether overseas numbers will stay at that level is the big challenge. Looking further into the medium term, they face significant challenges around the size of pension deficits that were already large pre-pandemic and have got even larger as a result of um, reductions in asset prices and rates of return. So I'm going to focus on higher education, uh, further education, I should say, and sixth forms. As I said, spending per student in, in colleges has fallen by about 12% in real terms. There's been an even larger fall in funding per student in school sixth form, which has fallen by about 23% over the last 10 years. And that's had very, very big challenges for colleges in sixth forms in providing a high quality of education. A um, recent report by the National Order Office, Office found that around one third of colleges were in deficit, which has been the same as it has been for the last five years. There's also been a narrowing of post-16 curriculum options across colleges and sixth forms, which is particularly concerning with respect to the quality of education offered to young people. Over the medium term, as with all areas of education, there are big challenges, some pre-existing, some related to the pandemic. Student numbers are likely to rise over the next four years, partly because of population growth, but also as more children go into uh, um, post-16 education due to the uh, worsening labour market. There will likely to be a drop in apprenticeship and training opportunities. There's likely to be huge changes to qualifications and funding structures. And just that, uh, as with schools, colleges and sixth forms faced the challenges of helping students catch up after lockdown. Um, but they also face the additional very different challenge that um, uh, like, there's likely to be a reduction in commercial demand for the services provided by colleges, which is likely to also provide a hit to their finances. Starting with rising student numbers, um, having fallen over the last 10 years, um, the population of 16 to 18 year olds is starting to rise again. now. Um, so the population bulge that was gradually working its way through primary and secondary schools has now hit colleges and sixth forms. Um, the number of 16 to 17 year olds is expected to rise by around 13% or just under 200,000 between 2019 and 2020. To 2023, with a 3% rise in this year alone. And in addition to that, um, greater numbers of young people uh, uh, have got um, uh, high GCSE results this year as a result of the exceptional situation with regard to the marking of GCSEs. 76% of uh, GCSE grades are at uh, four or above in 2020, as compared with 67% in 2018 2019. That has implications for post-16 education because it means that more young people will have met the benchmark set to get into particular forms of uh, particularly academic educational programmes. So there could be a shift in demand towards academic programmes because more young people will have the necessary results. There's also likely to be an increase in numbers in full-time education, simply as a result of there being a recession and economic uncertainty. And to say a little bit more about this, this graph shows the share of 16 to 18 year olds in full time education in red, which has gone up significantly over the last 35 years. The share of young people in um, part time educational training in the yellow, yellow bar, that includes apprenticeships and other forms of work based learning. And the number of young people in full time employment in, on the blue line, which has um, dropped significantly over time, they're only now about 2%. As you can see in the highlighted areas, um, during previous recessions, the number of young, the share of young people in full-time education has increased and then not dropped again. 
after the reset after the recession ended. So there's been a ratchet effect. In the in the recession of the early 90s, there was a 6.8 percentage point increase in participation, and in the Great Recession, nearly a four percentage point increase. Now participation is already very high, so we wouldn't expect um, anything like that kind of that kind of impact on participation this time round. However, there's, there's still potential for young people to move from part-time education or training into full-time education, particularly given the drop in apprenticeship and training opportunities. And to focus on this issue a bit more, um, during lockdown, there were initial surveys that were really, really quite concerning about the impact of economic uncertainty and, and social distancing requirements on provision of apprenticeships. So about 60% of employers said they'd stopped hiring new apprentices and only 40% were continuing as normal. And that feeds into a, actually a, a trend that was happening pre-pandemic. Um, the number of adult apprenticeships has been dropping over the last three or four years, which fell from around 700,000 in 2016 to around 580,000 in the latest complete year. And the share of young people on apprenticeships, quite surprisingly, has been falling over time. So it reached a high of 6.7% of 16 to 18 year olds in an apprenticeship in 2016. That's now back down to around 5.6%, which is about the same level as it was in 2010. The number of young people on apprenticeship has been dropping over time already. Um, the government introduced various measures to try and boost or counteract the drop in um, apprenticeships training and employment, particularly in its plan for jobs in the summer. This, these included apprenticeship incentives, so £2,000 for firms taking on new apprentices under 25, 1,500 for those over 25, um, provision of uh, funding for traineeships for 16 24 year olds and the kickstart scheme for 16 24 year olds on universal credit who are at risk of long-term unemployment with the latter perhaps being the most significant in new funding and the big question is whether is this sufficient to counteract the massive effects of economic downturn and uncertainty and the social distancing requirements and clearly that's got that's going to be a lot harder over the next month and maybe through part, the, the rest of the winter as well. Um, in terms of how the funding system re responds to the extra, sh extra students and the shifting mix of students across types of education, funding system will only respond partially and in a very incomplete way. So the government has already provided an extra 400 million pounds um, for further education and sixth forms in spending review last year which allows for a 5% real terms increase in total spending on 16 to 18 education, which will be the, the first time that uh, uh, there's been a real terms increase in spending on 16 education for at least 10 years. And there's also been a 101 million pound uh, uh, spending injection for 18 to 19 year olds um, who are continuing education this year. So that's for a further extra, extra number of students um, who, who, who continue this year. However, one quirk of the funding system is that funding to, funding to providers for 16 to 18 education is based on student numbers as determined in the previous year. That's a bit, a bit of a detail of the funding system and in normal years, colleges can, it's not ideal, but colleges kind of profile when we're here what's going on based on education. This is far from a normal year, both because of pre-pandemic effects and because of the pandemic itself. So th this is the turning point year for the student population, which is now having dropped over the last 10 years, is now rising again and expected to rise by at least 3% 3 3 this year based on the number of 16 to 17 year olds. And that's before we even consider the effects of higher GCSE results, shifting both the level and type of education young people are demanding and reduced training apprenticeship options. So, and we calculate that uh, just a, if there was a drop in apprenticeship training by around 15 to 20% amongst young people and those people shifted into full-time education, then student numbers would rise by around 5% this year. And that would erode any real terms increase in spending per student this year, which is naturally quite concerning from a uh, college and sixth form perspective, seeking to provide a good education for those young people, those extra young people. The funding system does have mechanisms within it to try and address those problems. Um, in particular, it has uh, a mechanism designed for exceptional rises in student numbers. However, quite importantly, it's subject to affordability. Um, and that mechanism is more designed for particular providers who receive exceptional increase in student numbers. It's not designed for a whole system receiving exceptional demand for further education this year. 
And given that um, the government has strongly, strongly encouraged providers to take on 16 to 18 young people who, who are able to continue education this year, um, it's incumbent on the government to be quite clear on how and when funding will, will be provided for those extra young people going into colleges and sixth forms this year. Finally, there's likely to be big changes to qualifications and funding. So some of that's already happened. So T levels began to be taught from September this year. That those are in three subjects and they'll be gradually rolling out across more subjects. The key component that's been more difficult this year is industry placements, which are a key component of T levels. And that's going to be more difficult in the current situation. The government's also said that it will restore public funding for first full level three or A level equivalent courses for all adults. Um, from April 2021 20, as part of the new National Skills Fund. Um, that reflects recommendations um, uh, from the post-18 funding review led by Philip Auger. Um, however, it will only reverse part of the cut to adult education spending over the last 10 years. So excluding apprenticeships, adult education spending fell by 50% in real terms or 1.4 billion between 2009 and 2019. The extra Level three funding is probably less than 500 million, so reverses up to about a third of that cut. Um, though we naturally expect further changes for both further and higher education um, in a white paper expected potentially later this year, but potentially delayed as well. So that's where I'll stop um, and I'll hand over to my colleague Jack to talk about higher education. Thanks, Luke. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the impacts of the pandemic uh, for higher education. Um, the focus is going to be on the implications for government spending on, on higher education and the implications for university finances. Now, it should be said that this, like much of the work on longer term impacts of the pandemic, is written under significant uh, uncertainty. Um, to understand the implications of government spending, I'm going to walk you through this simple illustrative chart, uh, which shows how finances flow through the system. First, we have uh, we have the government giving students income contingent loans for their tuition fees and their maintenance. Second, we have students uh, giving tuition and or paying universities in tuition fees and giving them some money for accommodation. Then universities are producing graduates who uh, make repayments on their student loans. These are worth 9% of their income above a certain threshold, which is currently um, £26,500. So just to put some numbers on this, before the pandemic, our predictions for the 2020 cohort were that this upfront spending from the government would be around £16.7 billion. Pounds, um, to put the 2020 cohort through their undergraduate degrees. In discounted present value terms, the current value of the student loan repayments for this cohort uh, would be around eight and a half billion pounds. So without COVID, the total long, long run contribution from the government for the 2020 cohort would have been 8.1 billion pounds, uh, i.e. the difference between what the government pays out up front and what it receives back in student loan repayments. I should say, just as an aside, that this ignores uh, increases in taxes that the government might get from people going through universities and therefore earning more. Um, we put out a report earlier this year looking at the lifetime returns to higher education where we estimated that the government benefits on average from people going to higher education, i.e. the increase in tax revenues that they receive outweigh the losses that they make on student loans. So that's an important a uh, little sub caveat to keep in mind. But anyway, back to the impact of the pandemic. Um, so the first thing uh, as has already been mentioned is the increase in student numbers that we've seen this year, at least partly because of the higher A-level results that, um, that have happened. Uh, we estimate around 15,000 extra students on a baseline of about 350,000. Which results in increased upfront government spending on tuition and maintenance loans for these students of about 900 million pounds. Of course, the government would get some of this back through student loan repayments, uh, but not as much as it outlays up front. Um, so we reckon overall this, this results in a loss of about 400 million for the government. So not huge. Uh, 
Now, this isn't the only thing. Uh, the other important factor is uh, worse employment and earnings of graduates and hence uh, lower student loan repayments. Based on this, we estimate losses of around 1.2 billion pounds for the 2020 cohort, resulting in overall losses of about 1.6 billion uh, compared to pre-pandemic predictions for the 2020 cohort, or a roughly 20% increase. Now, I would say that this 1.2 billion pound number, I thought it would be bigger. Um, one reason it isn't bigger is because of the repayment threshold for student loans being linked to average earnings. So when average earnings growth is poor, the student loan repayment threshold doesn't go up very much, protecting government revenues a bit. Okay, so that's the 2020 cohort, but what happens when we look across all of the cohorts who have outstanding student loan debt or meaningful outstanding student loan debt? We see on the right, we've got the 2020 cohort with the loss of around 1.6 billion, which includes the losses from uh, lower student loan repayments and the extra students. The earlier cohorts don't have the extra students, of course, but uh, they also have the hit in terms of lower student loan repayments. So we see about a slightly more than a billion for each of the last four cohorts before this year's, uh, a little bit less than a billion for each of the four cohorts between 2012 and 2015, and much smaller losses for the earlier cohorts for whom um, debts are lower, largely because of the, they faced a different and lower tuition fee regime. Um, I should say that this is under the OBR's pessimistic forecasting of earnings growth. I don't know whether that's just reflective of my own pessimism about the current situation. Um, but under them, their central scenario, the losses are smaller, about half uh, for each of the previous cohorts. Um, and under their upside scenario, the losses are actually uh, very small indeed. Um, overall, these add up, the cumulative sum of all these numbers is about 12 billion pounds under the pessimistic scenario, 5 billion under the central scenario, and just 700 million under the upside scenario under which uh, basically things are just gonna go back to normal pretty quickly, which currently seems unlikely, but hey, um, it, it, things could all improve with a vaccine. So, I mean, turning to that pessimistic scenario, that 12 billion number is quite big, I should say that. Um, it also should be said that that excludes potential costs for future cohorts who may also be affected, um, both in terms of the labour markets that they eventually face when they do leave university, but also because they've had rather interrupted uh, schooling and uh, university degrees that may also impact their productivity. These numbers also reduce, uh, ignore a potential risk to government finances of having to bail out uh, bankrupt universities. While the government doesn't seem like it's got much appetite for this at the moment, this does remain a very real possibility, leading me seamlessly on to uh, the current state of university finances. So back in uh, the summer, we released a detailed report where we outlined several risks to university finances, including reduced domestic and international student numbers, reduced income from things like accommodation and conferences and catering and things like that, reduced returns on any assets that universities hold and increased deficits on pension obligations. Now, in most cases, these things don't look too bad. For example, student numbers so far appear to have held up remarkably well, suggesting perhaps that the, the fairly benign period in terms of uh, COVID in the summer was timed perfectly in terms of uh, maximizing enrollments. However, the final case of pension obligations, things do look quite bad. So many university academics are on um, divine benefit pensions, which often pay a guaranteed fixed percentage of final salary or something related to their final salary. Universities are generally liable to make up the difference between what's promised to academics in terms of their pension payments and the financial returns on uh, the pension, contrib pension contributions that have already been made by those academics. Now, I should say that even before COVID, things were already bad, which is why we had things like uh, strikes about restructuring of uh, pension schemes. Um, so there was a deficit in terms of uh, pensions of around seven and a half billion in 2017. This improved a little bit in 2018 and got slightly worse in 2019, um, but nothing compared to what happened 
has happened uh, more recently with COVID making things look dramatically worse in terms of pension deficits, taking them to in excess of 20 billion pounds. So it's important to say that this number is really sensitive and based on expected returns on current investments, um, therefore moves around a lot as various financial indicators change. But it does highlight that there's a very serious problem here and major changes such as increasing employee contributions at universities appear to be very likely at the moment. So just to wrap up, um, so COVID has for now boosted student numbers and has slash will reduce average earnings and hence uh, student loan repayments. The design of the student loan system protects government revenues a little bit against that, but we still estimate under the pessimistic OBR uh, growth forecasts that uh, the government faces a cost of around 12 billion pounds, which is quite a big number. The university finances disaster has been avoided for now, as student numbers have held up, but the exception is that university pension obligations, which are already in bad shape, are now in terrible shape, raising questions about the financial viability of some institutions. However, it's worth noting that the introduction of lifelong learner loans, um, uh, loan allowances for tuition fees, as re recommended in the um, Philip Auger review, this could help the situation by bringing more students into the situation uh, into the system. Um, this would be especially welcome at, at the least selective institutions where university finances are currently weakest. Okay, um, that's all I have to say. Uh, I hope that worked okay. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Mary. Well, thanks very much, Jack, and, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's easy to make a case, isn't it, for more money for practically everything in education because it's so important, life-defining, economically and societally critical. But uh, it's also very, very expensive, as this report makes clear. And I, I read all the chapters in the report and couldn't help thinking about all the problems stored up early in the system that create the, the funnel of um, demand surpluses and deficits, the gaps, if you like, which, which so clearly define uh, the post-16 and post-18 landscape. Um, now, of course, schools and colleges all want catch-up support um, uh, for all year groups who lost out on, on so much during lockdown one. Um, but, but the IFS estimates that the extra support available for primary schools only amounts to about one tenth of the cost of, of one extra teaching assistant per school. Um, and while the lost schooling for younger children will be obviously a smaller percentage of their total time at school, we, we know that gaps that start early do tend to persist. Um, then the National Tutoring Programme, which I think is the right idea, highly targeted to those from lower income backgrounds who, who need it most. And, and I would like to see this extended to key stage five too, and, and hopefully continued after this year. But again, the report makes it clear that the scale of the uh, NTP might be relatively low compared with the, the scale of likely lost uh, learning. <clears throat> now, all this matters because these primary school children are the pipeline for future generations of students for further and higher education. And the secondary catch-up arrangements, of course, will have a much more near-term impact on progression to further and higher education. Um, possibly denting the report's uh, growth forecasts in participation. Uh, the report rightly weighs up the relative upside for universities of better enrolment numbers for, from domestic students this year and for several years to come against the near term uncertainties about international enrolments in COVID times. But clearly the biggest risk for universities is the, the hungry lion that is the university superannuation scheme. Um, quite why the scheme hasn't been closed to new members like most other DB schemes in the country still baffles me. But clearly pension costs of 60% uh, of salaries are, are just unaffordable. However, this might be split between employers and employees. Um, I also couldn't help reflecting that shifting the funding around between uh, for example, further and higher education is not in itself going to create the new higher and technical skills that the government uh, 
rightly wants to see to boost our economy and, and of course to fuel the post-COVID recovery. Um, with a very stark north-south divide in higher education participation, which is actually mirrored completely in reverse for further education in the north and south, uh, it's clear that post-16 funding alone won't level up progression and attainment if deprivation funding in primary and secondary education uh, is, is falling and, and has fallen fastest for deprived areas outside of London, um, uh, 13% since 2010. Now, of course, we'll need to wait for the promised further education white paper for more details of what and how the government intends to fund the tertiary sector. But in the meantime, uh, an estimated cost to the exchequer of £10,000 per year for three years for each higher education student is clearly less expensive than paying benefits to someone who's out of work. And, and at least higher education holds the possibility, uh, if, if not the promise, uh, of financial upsides, whereas short term unemployment too often translates to longer term unemployment and, and continuing cost to the taxpayer. Um, so finally, just to wrap up, can I just point to some other factors which uh, aren't part of the excellent report. So my list includes um, a shift of spending in universities um, and colleges from physical estates to digital estates. And with, with a move to a, if you like, a digital residential model of teaching and learning, uh, the potential comprehensivization of universities as students vote to live at or closer to home, perhaps taking advantage of new funding options for part-time or sort of roll-on, roll-off models. Um, <clears throat> big changes in the way people live and work post-COVID, I think will have a significant impact on large cities, which of course are also accommodating large student populations. You know, but if the, if the supply of part-time jobs in uh, retail and hospitality shift with these new working patterns for adults, uh, the economics of residential higher education uh, could start to look less and less attractive or affordable for students or, or indeed the public purse. Um, also reflected that it's going to be hard to get meaningful collaboration between higher education and further education, working with local communities and employers if, if FE is still very largely a, a local and community provision um, and if higher education remains uh, much more of a, a national, international and, and away from home option. Um, and also finally the, the need for universities to create their own catch-up schemes um, and digital access and participation plans, digital APPs if you like, to ensure that equalities gaps aren't permanently seared on post-COVID cohorts. So uh, in short, um, creating new funding regimes for further and higher education based on the, on the pre-COVID era uh, might prove to be a bit premature. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to Philip Auger, author of his famous eponymous report, Philip. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Uh, first of all, I'd actually like to uh, congratulate the IFS on uh, another uh, outstandingly researched and well-presented report and, and part of a, a very apposite um, series which you, are, which you are producing on this uh, important subject. As Paul mentioned at, at the beginning, I chaired the, uh, the May government's post-18 education and funding review, and I was a, a co-author of the, of the report, but I just need to emphasize that uh, today I'm speaking absolutely in a personal capacity. And I really want to just um, stand back from this report and take a look at how the post-18 education sector might look given a vastly different set of economic criteria as, as the IFS have pointed out and profound changes in the world of work in over the next few years. I really just want to make three points and obviously the theme of the pandemic will through, flow through all of them. The points are to do with the structure of post-18 education. It's the first one. Secondly, the skills 
gap, the skills issue, and thirdly, how a new model might look. So first of all, first of all, on structure. Uh, I feel that the pandemic and the, the post-pandemic uh, economy and, and world of work makes it imperative that we address the issues, structural issues in post-18 education that were already there. And the structural issues I have in mind are, uh, first of all, as the, as the IFS lay out in grisly detail, um, a chronic underinvestment in FE going back many years. And secondly, uh, turning to our generally excellent university system, at the margin, there is a misalignment with the country's economic needs and what we can afford. So those two issues, the underinvestment in FE and the misalignment in HE need, I feel, to be uh, addressed as a matter of urgency. Second, secondly, I want to talk a bit about um, skills and in the inevitable um, post-pandemic dislocation in the world of work. Many firms, I suspect, will recover from the pandemic, but many firms will not, and all will exist in a very different world. Many workers will need to retrain and reskill for young people to get a job in the first place, for older people to stay in work uh, in, in, a, in a, a, a rapidly evolving uh, marketplace. So that, that the, the reskilling and retraining is, is, it seems to me to be pointed up by the pandemic. But furthermore, the pandemic has, has exposed weaknesses in relying on global supply chains. And it has exposed in this country, at least, critical weaknesses in some science and technology industries. We simply cannot ignore this, and there needs to be, it seems to me, an investment. We need to correct our underinvestment, actually, in STEM-related disciplines. So thirdly, um, how might a new model look? I believe that we do need to rethink the relationship between HE and FE. The Prime Minister made an important speech on this on the 29th of September at, at Exeter College, and he spoke about correcting, and if I may quote, the bogus distinction between FE and HE. The conventional three-year degree, I'm sure, will remain central to our post-18 education offer. But as the IFS point out, it's expensive for the ex exchequer, and I believe that at the margin needs to be better aligned with our economic needs. That means finding ways to introduce STEM incentives for institutions and students, and to address the higher technical level four or five type of opportunities. F the FE sector simply needs refunding, refunding big time so that it can equip young people and mature adults for this fast changing workplace. I suspect that both parts of the sector will have to work together to take advantage of the lifetime skills guarantee, the potential for modular and flexible level four or five education, that I think we will be, will be required to respond to this fast changing workplace. So I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely gloomy about this. Um, sometimes benefits, great benefits arise from severe dislocation and disruption. And I think there will be a, a, an economic imperative and government direction to ensure that these important sectors respond to this new world. I think back to you, Paul, now to bring this all together. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Luke, Jack, Mary, um, Philip, and of course to Josh for his very kind introductory words. We've got 15 minutes or so now um, for questions, of which there are already a number on Slido, but do feel free to uh, add the ones you have, or indeed comments uh, such as this one from David Barra saying it was all very informative. That's also very much um, appreciated. 
Um, I, there's, a, there's a question here, which I think is probably best directed at you, um, Philip, which I think is quite an interesting one, um, which is how much can policymakers really shift students' attitudes towards selecting courses or indeed institutions? Is that something, I mean, how, how malleable do you think those things are? Because when you're talking about encouraging people either to go to FE instead of HE, or you're talking about encouraging people to do um, uh, STEM or other subjects which have higher economic returns, it's easy enough to say it, but um, I think there is some scepticism implied here that, uh, that actually uh, students are that malleable. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a good it's a good question, and um, the, honest, honestly, I don't know the answer to it. But I think I, I think there are, there are some pointers. It's not just the matter of policymakers um, directing students. Uh, there's also something that inst the institutions themselves can do, and policymakers can incentivize the institutions to to go in a certain direction. I think there's also a really important role for employers here. Employers have got a uh, you know, in, in, in many respects, they're the dog that don't bark in the night on, on this, but they are, they are also, they are, they are one of the consumers of what uh, HE and FE put out. And they, they can make it clear, both at local and at national level, the, what are the skills they value? What are, they, what, are they, what are the skills they pay for? And organizations like your own, Paul, can make this, can make it clear in terms of the research that, that you put out, where the where the best returns for graduates and 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 uh, FE students can be found. So I, I don't think it's it's only down to policymakers. It's 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 a mix of each. Mary or Jack, would you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I do I do think we have a bit of a problem at sixteen in that there's a sort of complete bifurcation post sixteen between STEM and non STEM. And typically only students with, you know, with very strong GCSE grades in STEM subjects will, you know, go on to serious um, STEM study at level three, whereas, a, a, you know, a much broader base of grades will support level three study in non-STEM subjects. And so I do think that narrowing of the curriculum post-16 is, is a real problem. Um, and the uh, you know the that young people get into their heads that they're not they're not technologically able and they're not sciencey because those seem to only be supported by very high grades. So I do you know there's a sort of super highway, isn't there, from GCSEs to A levels to to universities, and then there's a sort of rather poorly um, signposted slipway off currently to various vocational options. And somehow it seems to me that if the key stage four curriculum doesn't um, broaden out and, and get people interested in some of the vocational pathways. Um, and then at uh, post-16, there's, there's less narrowing of the curriculum. I think it's going to be very difficult to feed, uh, you know, this clear new need for level four and five and more STEM skills. So, so I think it's a whole system issue and not just an issue for further and higher education and how it's funded. Great, thank you. Um, Shibu, there's a couple here, a couple of questions about um, differences between England and evolved administrations. I mean, Luke, do you um, have anything to say about across the education sectors, whether there are similarities or differences between England and the devolved administrations, particularly since you're sitting there in sunny Wales? Uh, indeed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so in, within the schools chapter, we look at spending per pupil across the four nations of the UK and how that's evolved over time and how the levels compare. So spending per pupil is very similar in England and Wales, um, but spending per pupil has fallen by less in Wales than it has in England over the last 10 years. Spending per pupil is a lot higher in Scotland as compared with the other three nations and has seen a big boost recently, partly as a result of uh, like an in increase in teacher pay of around 8-9%. Um, spending with people is a lot lower in Northern Ireland than the rest of the UK, which is, and is a bit of an outlier, having, having a, a lower level and a bigger cut over the last 10 years. Um, we have only been able to look at schools um, out across the UK in this, in this report, but we hope to be looking at the other areas of education in the future as well. Um, but I'd also point you to uh, another report I've written, 
uh, comparing um, responses to the pandemic across the UK, um, which also looks at the differing uh, support for the early years and how that's evolved over the last six months. Right, and, and Jack, do we um, do, do you have anything on the state of university finances in the different nations? Um, not so much. Ben, do you have anything to add on this? I think you're on mute, Ben. Um, no, okay, well, we'll um, uh, move on to uh, another question, which I think I'll um, also point to you, Jack, which is, um, I suppose, reflecting that um, tailing off in um, spending per student over the last decade in universities. Do, do you think university tuition fees need to be indexed linked to inflation? Um, I think, I th well, I mean, they are in theory, um, but they just, uh, they're often frozen. Um, so I think, I think it makes sense to have a clear policy on you know, university tuition fees. So uh, they should keep them uh, the same in real terms over time. And then if they want to change them, they should change them with reform rather than kind of changing them through the back door by squeezing them down, um, which ultimately is what happened, what has happened since 2012. They went up uh, to £9,000 and then they've been frozen nearly every year. So I think it's only twice that they've actually gone up and they've been frozen again for the for this year and I think for next year. So, um, uh, yeah, I, it, it doesn't make sense to me that you sort of don't have a clear policy on this and just just uh, just let things evolve over time and squeeze it and the, the income from uh, tuition fees to, to gradually decline without stating in advance what the actual plan is so yeah i think it should be great um I, there is a question I, there's something i wanted to explore a bit more it's something that you certainly brought up uh jack and, and mary you you referred to it in fairly um uh as a as a, as a, as a big issue uh, which is the uh university superannuation scheme i mean the numbers in the report are pretty uh, striking, uh, to put it mildly, uh, in terms of uh, the most recent estimated valuation, would I think, um, you know, if, if, if uh, contributions were to shift immediately in response to that estimated valuation, need to move to 60% of, of salary. I mean, that clearly is telling us there's something um, unsustainable about the, uh, about the scheme. Um, uh, Mary, perhaps you'd like to say a little bit more about your view that it should be shut, um, and then maybe um, maybe Ben or Jack could, could add a little more colour to the uh, to, to the analysis they've done. Um, yes, well, I should first say that I'm by no means a, um, a pensions or a, or a USS uh, expert, but but actually, when I was at UCAS, we we were a member of the scheme. Um, and uh, and it, it, it was very clear to me then that this was unsustainable and we, we looked at whether we could get out. But of course, because it's a, a mutual scheme, uh, it's almost completely unaffordable for anybody to get out. And in fact, um, I think the USS is quickly trying to close the door on that option after one of the Oxford or Cambridge colleges in, indeed bought itself out. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's clear 60% <clears throat> of, of, of salaries on cost for pensions is, is unaffordable, Who you know, whoever ends up uh, paying for it. And it'll simply make higher education uh, un uneconomic um, in, in current terms. And, um, you know, so, so, so I've sort of said perhaps, um, uh, um, you know, a bit flippantly that we should close the scheme to, to new members and, and that in itself isn't going to fix the problem. But I can't help feeling that literally every day that goes by, new members are, are being added to this scheme and, and storing up financial risk, you know, for 30, 40 years ahead. And so that's a question that I keep asking myself, but no doubt that's heresy amongst um, higher education colleagues, but I'm, I'm sure other people know much more about this than I do. Ben, did you want to add any colour to the analysis that, 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 that Jack's presented? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So, um, yeah, so I guess, as Jack said, it's all um, very uncertain. It's very clear from these huge numbers, 21.5 billion deficit, uh, 
in a preliminary estimate from August um, that there is a real problem, but just how big the problem is, is very hard to tell. And um, I guess to some extent it should be pointed out that there is also a political issue with um, the pension scheme having one view and the um, universities and colleges union having a very different view of um, the finances of this scheme. But um, so I guess in our analysis, we now have a central estimate of um, 8 billion as a sort of cost by 2024 of evening out those deficits, but it could be much higher. It could be lower than that, depending on what um, universities and their staff agree on. I mean, I think one of the striking things is that it's already something like a 30% contribution rate. And I'm not sure that students quite appreciate how much of their... Um, uh, how much of their student loans are, uh, student fees are going into uh, paying uh, paying these uh, paying these pensions? Um, we are a couple of minutes um, uh, from the end. Um, we've probably got one time for one very quick question, which may uh, Jack, you may or may not not know the answer uh, to. Which is, um, can, do we know anything about? Um, going into um, numbers going into postgraduate um, HE, both uh, with the advent of, of, of loans, but also um, COVID. I mean, do we have any up-to-date numbers on what's happening to postgraduate numbers? Yeah, there's, a, there's just a lot less information available about uh, postgraduate numbers at the moment. Um, so our kind of projections are that um, that actually it's the institutions that most reliant on postgraduate students are the most financially at risk in terms of uh, the hit they take from lost student numbers because we think postgraduates are probably more likely to kind of defer uh, because maybe they're doing, um, they, they have jobs that they can hold on to until the situation clears up and they can actually be taught in, uh, in lecture halls and things like that. So. Um, yeah, the, the, the numbers are not very clear because we only work off UCAS um, and so the, and they don't tell us what we need in terms of the postgraduate numbers, but we suspect that uh, there might be a bit more of a problem uh, there. And that, but that's kind of bubbling behind the surface because there's, there's so little, uh, there's so few statistics available um, on this. Okay, well, on that um, on that final admission of um, ignorance, we should probably uh, we should probably end this. Um, this webinar. Thank you ever so much to everyone who's been um, who's been watching. Uh, thank you very much uh, to my colleagues Luke, Ben, and, uh, and and Jack, to Mary and Philip for their fantastic contributions, and uh, I suppose especially in the end to Josh and the Nuffield Foundation for making it uh, all possible. Thank you very much. <laughs>